Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. So it's already announced, so I would like to discuss some stochastic partial differential equations with cross-diffusion terms. So these are parabolic equations, but they're systems. And then the difficulty becomes of the coupling. Somehow similar like in the previous talk. And since these are systems have some, some mathematical issues, so for instance, the diffusion matrix is not positive definite in general. I need some special techniques. So what I need to do is, after some introduction about um, the problem, to speak about the statistic equations, just to tell you what we are doing. And then I will explain to you how we can these techniques in some sense to the setting. Okay, so the topic is that we want to study systems like we have presented here. So you see that we have here a system of parabolic equations with the diffusion coefficients a, i, j, depending on u, u. Use just the vector of uh, all the components, ui. Um, <coughs> then on the right hand side, we have some multi vector noise, which is also coupled here with some stochastic diffusion, the sigma uh, ij. And you could also add some, some <coughs> terms, but just for simplicity, since otherwise the formulas become too long, I neglect the thing. So everything is uh, considered in a bounded domain O. Some initial conditions, and here I consider <coughs> the applications of the flux boundary conditions. Um, so these W here are cylindrical uh, Wiener processes, so the, with standard assumptions. And these equations model uh, yeah, multi component systems. I will give you two examples later, since, well, most. Um, <coughs> uh, models in nature consist of several components. So either you're considering populations and you have different species, or you have gases or fluids which are consisting of different components, like air, uh, of different type. And therefore, here the left hand side somehow is taking care of these uh, multi component uh, character. Uh, the stochastic term here on the right hand side is just a stochastic forcing. So this describes, in this context, just the random influence of the environment. So this is just plugged in. I will come to this point later. But on the left-hand side, depending a little bit on the diffusion coefficients you have here, you can derive uh, the corresponding models without stochastic components from other models, uh, from fluid dynamics, or from interacting particle systems. OK, so I promise two examples, just to fix the ideas. And I've taken one example from biology, so this is about syndicating populations, and another one from physics, from stochastic And uh, so this is just first uh, <coughs> deterministic equation. In fact, part of, half of my talk is just about the deterministic equation. Sorry for that. I need to introduce the techniques. OK, so here uh, I have the fusion coefficients a, i, j, which are uh, like that one. So the delta here is the de uh, uh, Kronecker delta. And the UIs are describing population densities. And in this context, the populations, they don't like each other. So they have the tendency to segregate. And the model has been developed by three Japanese people, so Shigesada, Kawasaki, and Teramoto in the 70s, in order to describe this phenomenon. And here, we want uh, to understand that. So there are some mathematical difficulties which make the, the, uh, the problem exciting. So first of all, for systems of parabolic equations, Maybe you know there's no maximum principle, but since we have to deal with densities, it would be nice to get our non-negativity at least almost surely, and that's not clear if you don't have a maximum principle. Moreover, you can observe that in general for these coefficients small a, i, j, which are non-negative uh, constants, the matrix uh, is, well, neither symmetric nor positive definite in general, which is one of the main difficulties. OK, so this is one, uh, one problem we would like to include in our the, uh, the class of equations we can um, deal with. The other example is <coughs> even older to some extent. These are the Maxwell-Stefan equations. And Maxwell and Stefan have derived this about 150 years ago. So now you may wonder, oh, these models, what's happening? Well, the answer is simple. The people just didn't understand the mathematics. It is rather recent. That people considered systems of parabolic equations of this type and developed some techniques. To so here, to, to make life a little bit easier, I just consider uh, 
three components and they're not densities, they're mass, mass fractions, since they sum up to one. So I'm considering here a gas consisting of three components <clears throat> and in some, yeah, in some sense I just give the percentage of the gas inside of the mixture. So this is then the variable ui and uh, the simplification is that I just uh, yeah, consider here these three components. So it's because of this equation here, the one component u0 for instance could be replaced by one minus u1 minus u2, so eventually I end up with a system of two equations. Therefore the diffusion matrix is uh, of type two times two, and you can compute it uh, from some physical considerations, it looks like that one, uh, where the A is just here this component, uh, this expression which is positive, and the Di's are positive numbers, there is some kind of diffusion potential. Okay, again here you, you can see this is not symmetric, in general, not positive definite. And here, it's inverse, since you not only want to have a lower bound, and also an upper bound. Since, because of this equation, you would like to have this expression here that ui is bounded by one from above. Okay, so this somehow is the setting of the problem. And now the question is how to deal with this. And we found that, in fact, also others before us, that there's some thermodynamic structure behind, which can be exploited uh, for the mathematics. What does it mean? So again, let us consider the uh, deterministic equation first. And by entropy structure, um, I understand that there exists a so-called entropy density, or free energy density, if you like, which is defined on some set D, which may be bounded or unbounded, it contains all these components, densities, or mass rates. This will be convex, and it has a very strange property um, that the old diffusion matrix multiplied by the inverse of the Hessian of this entropy density. This gives you a new matrix, which I call B. And this is positive definite or positive semi-definite, more precisely. And I assume that the uh, first derivative of this entropy density is invertible. Mm -hmm. Okay, why? So first, um, this property here, or this definition, helps me to rewrite the system in different terms. So this equation here can be rewritten in these terms. So that means I or define a new variable, W, which I call entropy variable, which is just H prime of U. And then after some manipulation, I see, okay, this expression here in the brackets is exactly that one. So I've somehow made my problem positive definite in some sense. But now the price to pay is that the U is not an independent variable, but I'm uh, somehow working here with the W variable in this formulation. And the densities or mass fractions are a function of the W and they're given by, the, by this expression. And here you see that they need invertibility. Okay, so this is one thing. Um, this in fact is, is not something very surprising. It's well known in physics, but it took some time to understand that people from physics really knew this already. And the matrix B usually is called the Onsager matrix. The W here is not called entropy variable. I use the notion entropy variable since there's a relation also to hyperbolic conservation laws. Uh, but in fact, in physics, this is just called mechanical potential. And the advantage is uh, with this formulation that you can see that the so-called second law of thermodynamics is valid, or mathematically spoken, that the entropy, which is just the uh, spatial integral of the ent entropy density, that this is a Lyapunov functional in, well, no, no, not uh, Lyapunov. Yes. Lyapunov functional in that setting. Okay, why? So when I take just the formal uh, time derivatives, then you see that I have this expression, the h prime of u by definition is the w. I plug in here this formulation, or this equation in that formulation, integrate by plus ones, then I get the minus sign, the gradient of the w, I get this expression, and since b is, well, in fact, positive, simply it's enough. Get a sign, so that means I really get some information. I get some estimates. This is what I would like to have. Moreover, and this is somehow the main novelty here, is that I, I get the bounds, the physical bounds I would like to have. Since if the B, so this is here the definition for the entropy density, where all these densities or mass fractions lie in, if this is bounded, so for instance for the mass fractions, this is true, then when I compute, or I let's say I solve this uh, problem. I have some w's, and I invert here this, uh, this yeah, algebraic relation. Then I know, since I assume that this is invertible as a function from d to r, that uh, point-wise I lie automatically in the space d. So I know that the u also is bounded. I do not 
need and I do not use any maximum principle, it's somehow hidden in the problem. Yeah, it's a physical property. Okay, so for sure these, these problems have been already considered by other people. So, well, in fact, the Russian have been the first. Uh, you know, there's a big book of Ladichenska, uh, Solonikov, head of Alcheva, who have considered such problems. They needed a lot of assumptions since they had not all these. <coughs> uh, let's say theory we have now. Among maybe then was the first one to uh, uh, treat this in a more let's say functional analytical way uh, to get low existence of solutions. <coughs> then the relation between parabolic problems, hyperbolic conservation laws, uh, and the relation to yeah, physics in some extent is uh, found by Kawashima and uh, Shizuka. And Alter and Gluckhaus uh, considered the so called non degenerate things. I will tell you in a minute what I mean by that, since I will consider the degenerate things in general. Okay, so let us reconsider the examples and to see whether this structure really exists for these kind of examples. And I claim yes, this, it does. And for the entropy density, I consider or I define this functional here. So these <coughs> of n components of positive values. And I have a U log U structure and I sum over all these components. So this is the Boltzmann or Boltzmann Shannon entropy density. Okay. Then the entropy variable by definition is just the partial derivative, so it's the logarithm. And then you see that what I have uh, told you on the previous slide about this inversion of the H prime can be done explicitly here. But you see that my densities are just the exponential of the entropy variables, and well, they are positive. Yeah, so that means whenever I'm able to solve the problem in the W variable, I just uh, transform back to the physical variables and I get positivity, or if I have some appro approximation procedure, non-negative densities. Moreover, I get some estimates, so when I uh, compute here the time derivative of the entropy, then in fact since my matrix is at least positive uh, definite in the interior of, well, on, on Z, then I even get some nice estimates, depending a little bit on the assumptions I impose on, on the parameters. In this case, even I get H1 bounds. For the Maxwell Stefan pr uh, problem, things are slightly more complicated since I use again the same entropy, but I start at zero. So I, had, I told you that I'm replacing the U0 variable by one minus U1 minus U2. So I only have two equations at the end. But for the entropy, I need to include or uh, to consider also this uh, U0 variable, which you may consider like a solvent concentration, for instance. Yeah? Therefore, I, I singled out here this U0. So this is defined on a triangle, this one here, uh, in R2 in this <coughs> case. And the entropy variable can be also computed here explicitly. It's uh, similar to the previous expression. This also can be uh, inverted. Uh, keep in, in mind that the u0 is given as a function of u1 and u2, so I can invert this explicitly and then you get this expression and then you see this really indeed is an at least pointwise an element in this triangle D. So you get, you get these bounds. For the entropy inequality you get something similar. Uh, okay, you have the square root here, so you have slightly different gradient estimates, but also you also get some information. Okay, so this is then something which we can uh, put into a theorem. We now more or less which kind of assumptions we need. So we need some entropy density which is smooth enough. Uh, we have seen uh, there's a Hessian, so a second derivative should exist and be continuous. H prime should be invertible on some, some domain D here. And I need some positive definiteness assumption. And here comes uh, the play with the degenerate assumption. So what do I mean by this? I would like to have that this expression here, which is uh, so you see from, from the previous slide, I've reformulated this in terms of U, therefore the matrix is slightly different, but I would like to have that this is positive, yeah, definite would be nice. Then I will get uh, some, some gradient estimates. But unfortunately, with these examples, usually you cannot expect this positive definiteness uh, in this sense, independent of U, so uniform positive definiteness. But in general, you have something like this one. So in the example, for instance, where we had the Maxwell Stefan equation, I think here we have m equal one and two, yeah. m equal one half. So that gives then, if you replace the zi or the z by the gradients of the uis, 
then you get an estimate for a gradient uh, from u i's up to some power. So m here in this case can be equal to negative. <coughs> and if m is negative, you get a kind of gross medium uh, nonlinearity, and therefore I call this degenerate case. Also for m between zero and one, it's maybe more like fast diffusion, but it's probably something which is nonlinear. Okay, and then the, under these assumptions, and well, in this <coughs> formulation, I have a proof that the d, uh, d is bounded, but it's not uh, not necessary to some extent. Um, the initial datum should satisfy some some regularity assumptions, and clearly it should be also bounded or <coughs> domain d. And then there exists a the deterministic system, a global solution, so d in the deterministic sense, with uh, some regularity. Um, these uh, Sobolev Bochner spaces. Okay, the aim now is to get a similar yeah, result for the stochastic system. So we would like to add here the stochastic form. So I put here on the right hand side, so this is a compact formulation. Uh, this expression here, again, this is the formulation of <coughs> the W variable that D then is given by this expression. Okay, so how, how could we somehow approach this problem? So you could say, well, why not using the same technique we did for the deterministic case? I have not told you how, how I did it. Now I tell you. So what we did is that we took the parallel <coughs> equation, the W variable, and we have used the implicit order scheme. Then we have an elliptic system, and with an elliptic system, it's a little bit easier to deal with the regularity issues. We are adding some approximate, some regularization, we get existence of solution path to the limit, and so on. But the implicit Euler scheme here is a problem, since this we cannot do for, uh, on the stochastic level. So that means that this approach here uh, from the previous slides that cannot be used. Okay, we have seen during this workshop already that semigroup theory very often is very, very powerful. But unfortunately for cross-diffusion systems, usually, at least when you're looking for global solutions, you cannot use it. Yeah. So also this approach cannot be used. Moreover, one approach which is very also very powerful is the stochastic Galerkin method. Uh, but here the problem is that you need test functions which are nonlinear in the variable. So in fact, what you're doing or what is behind this entropy business is that you're using h prime of u as a test function that's nonlinear, and then everything breaks down. Okay, so we need something new, and this is somehow here the, the key of this presentation. We have uh, used a new regularization. Um, in order to deal with these issues. And the regularization of the idea is that we are regularizing the entropy variable. Yeah. Since the entropy variable should be nice in a good space, in fact, in L infinity, in order to make all these point-wise transformations, yeah, transforming back and forth. Okay, how we do? So we are take a, an operator um, in L2, defined on, on some densely defined domain DL, such that this domain is an L infinity and should be a self-adjoint operator. So I wrote here example. Well, this is just to, to give you some ideas. You could use or you could think of the L of U as a realization like a B Laplacian or Laplacian to some power. I wrote everything in quotation marks since, well, when I have here a big M, so M should be bigger than D over 2 in order to get this uh, embedding here, then you need to prescribe boundary conditions and that's a bit delicate. So therefore, what we did is just we used an abstract uh, result by, I forgot the name is from the 60s, uh, where uh, you can prove that such an operator really exists. It's just abstract. Uh, yep. Excuse me, I guess that you mean more or less delta to the M, and not L outside. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. thanks, <coughs> thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this, M, so this V should be outside of the bracket. Okay, so then we are regularizing. So we have here the U of D, we are adding epsilon times this expression, so L star L, so stars the adjoint, in fact, would be L square, but by this you see better how to um, do this. And then um, the inverse of Q epsilon of this object here is called R epsilon, this is our regularization, since it embeds the, uh, it um, transports the dual space DL, which is usually a big space, to the DL, which is a regular but small space. So the Q epsilon of W epsilon, we call it V. This approximates then our yeah, densities or mass fractions. And the R epsilon, the inverse, so I just invert here this, this equality here, then the W epsilon is an, is an approximation of the entropy value. 
And then what we would like to solve is this problem here, where the U of W three plus W B, and this is here the W epsilon which corresponds to the summation of the entropy. Yeah. So this is something we have to do. Uh, is it the domain here. you want just the domain of L to be there with things of three B and I think probably mean N bigger than B over four. Uh, Ah, ah, okay, since I have here is uh, two derivatives. Okay, such that the embedding of HM is in, in, in H2M. Uh, H, no, in, in the weak formulation, since I have only weak solutions, then I'm working just in HM. So you want the domain of L to the one half? Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. So let's fix the, the notation of solution. We are working with very weak solutions. Issues and the martingale solution is defined in the usual way. So, this is a triple consisting of a stochastic basis, uh, then it is uh, the solution U. Uh, now, you may be surprised since I'm working with the W's. In fact, the idea is that for the approximation, you're working with the entropy variables, uh, then you get a solution of the approximate problem. But when you pass to the limit, you don't have much information about the entropy variables, but you have estimates for the physical variables. U. Therefore, at the end, we get um, the solution in the densities or mass fractions. So but here with the tilde, and the uh, W tilde then is, uh, is another cylindrical uh, process with U tilde. And we have a big formulation, the mm -hmm. one for the usual one, where we put the derivatives uh, to the test function phi. Okay, so which assumptions do we need? So this is a feature between the standard assumptions uh, you need for, for the stochastic PDE and the assumptions you need for the deterministic PDE, so plus something additional. Okay, for the initial datum, we are taking something which has the correct measurability assumption, and we need to do the domain here. So here you see this uh, condition, the multiplicative noise is, has values in a, a different phase uh, class operator space. This with linear growth, also very standard. Uh, for the entropy density, we just assume we have uh, orderly we put on the physical line, so we have these kind of degenerate uh, both um, definitions. What is new here is that we need a condition between the entropy density and the noise. So we need, so this is a very compact formulation, that some expressions where the entropy density and the noise appears should be bounded. In fact, boundedness is not really needed. Some integrability assumption is, is enough. But let's keep it for that one, since then I can better explain what's happening. So let's discuss these assumptions. So I already mentioned that the assumptions here on, on the variables are more or less like in the deterministic case. Uh, here I made a mistake. There should be also beta depending on t in order to uh, yeah, write down how the uh, cylindrical beta process should lie. An orthonormal basis in this um, Hilbert space U. And the intention of the entropy and the noise comes from the fact that, in some sense, I have a stochastic uh, uh, forcing term, but it should be in such a way that it does not destroy the physical bounds. But this is on a very weak level. Um, but you can see it maybe in the following way. So we want to use H prime as a test function on the right hand side. H prime, when uh, the entropy density is of u log u type, uh, is then the logarithm. So that means we would like to have some information about this expression. So if the sigma, the uh, stochastic diffusion, becomes very large, then you may think you're losing the physical bounds. The forcing should be not too large when the densities are close to zero, let's say, in order not to get negative values. So therefore, we, we need some, some assumption. And you may think, OK, uh, that here should be under control. So when u is equal to zero or close to zero, then you should have some control on that one. And this you can express as a boundedness assumption. In fact, boundedness is not needed, just some integrability is enough. Yeah? You, are you considering uh, it or noise, right? Yeah. So if you use Stratonovich, can you improve like... Yeah. yeah. In fact, we have to do with that one of Stratonovich noise, but in fact, we translate it to Ito noise and then we have... Uh, Let's put some more conciliation and then uh, the situation is better. Uh, <laughs> At least to our knowledge. Maybe we can do it better. <laughs> I don't know, but sometimes you get some more conciliation. We're just hoping that. Uh, not really. I think this Ito even was slightly better formulating the conditions. 
this Parfonovich, since he formulated everything in Ito, then he had some this correction term. But then he, we have not really seen what is there then. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so that means that um, to have some condition on the interaction between the entropy and the noise is natural in order to preserve the physical bound. Okay, now the question is since we have, uh, you have seen here uh, that we have quite a number of conditions coming from, from all these estimates and the Ito lemma. Uh, is there something which satisfies our assumptions? And the answer is yes. It is just an, to give you an example for sure, you can have much more general examples as this one here. So then the noise is by something where you have the UI here. So if UI is zero, then this also vanishes. As I said, it's not really necessary. And then something which takes care of the regularity in order to identify this. Um, <coughs> in these relative different space. Okay. Then, under this assumption, we, we again have the bounds, and this comes again from the entropy structure. So that means we are solving everything in the terms of, of the V variable. We plug it in in the regularization operator, and then outside we have this function ui, which is expressing the density. And since this is uh, equal to the inverse of h prime, uh, at least point-wise, almost surely we are lying in the space D. So we have a regulation of these. <coughs> Variables, positivity for the population model, and then bounds between zero and one. Okay, then let's go to the, um, to the theory. Uh, I started a quarter two, isn't it? Ah, oh, much faster. Okay, okay so in the theory, uh, it helps us when these assumptions are explained to the board, then we get a global aggregate solution to this problem. The sense that then the new variable, the tilde, is in the um, closure of this domain. Okay, maybe just a couple of words about the proof. Um, inside of these new ideas I've introduced, it's more the standard, but maybe it's good just to give you the, the steps of the proof. So, what we do is that um, the regular rate is essentially <coughs> by using this regularization operator, which is the inverse of this component here. We're solving this expression here. And uh, there we are using just a standard regularization uh, in order to get solutions for this approximation. <coughs> then we want to get estimates uh, or using the entropy inequality, or we, we want to derive the approximation of entropy inequality. Then we need to do the lemma. So we are using a kind of nonlinear test function, the H prime of proof. And you know that there are many <coughs> lemmas on the market, and we use a, a version of And then we get something which is very similar to the entropy density I've shown to you before. We have some information about the entropy. We have some information about the gradients. And then for sure we also have some term which is coming from the regularization. Okay, this gives us some, uh, some gradient bounds uh, with the expectation. Uh, also some higher order, um, some higher order probability bounds. And these bounds, uh, please look, don't look at that one. I made a mess with mixing deterministic and stochastic terms. So this is the correct one. <coughs> this one, yeah, copy and paste. Okay, so we have these uh, bounds here, and then what we are doing, uh, what we need is uh, similar like for deterministic uh, uh, QDEs, that we need information about um, the, gra the spatial gradient, the time derivative. So for the spatial gradient, we have information. For the time derivative, we get a little bit less because of the stochastic setting, because of the linear process. And then we already heard in this conference that you can use either the Aldous condition, or alternatively, we found that in some, sense, in some cases it's nicer to work in super Slobodesky uh, spaces, which means that you have a, a regularity in time, which is not a first derivative, but a fraction derivative. OK, but this just happens. Then, because of these uniform bounds, then our, we, we, we can see that um, the laws of these approximate densities is tight in a sub uh, space. I've not written it down. It mainly consists of the spaces which are written down here. And then, by the scope of Jakub-Bosky theorem, we get our strong convergence. That means that there exists a subsequence of this converging. This one is converging to zero in some spaces. We have also some deconvergence and so on. And then what we can do is there are two things. So first we we can prove that this is a tilde here, so the new variable is uh, really bounded. <coughs> the bounds is somehow 
what is, uh, needs a little bit some, some work is to prove that the new identities and the new MENA processes are really satisfying the information. That's a bit. Okay, that's uh, more or less what I wanted to say. You let me summarize, maybe, since there yeah. have been some new information. So I uh, uh, was able to prove global martingale solutions to certain classes of stochastic proteins. Situations. We are using the entropy structure from the deterministic uh, case, which uh, gives us mathematically <coughs> physical point-wise bounds. This is somewhat a nice feature. We are, from a technical viewpoint, we need a new regularization of the entropy variable to have a good approximation. There, for sure, there's a drawback of that approach. The concept of multi-gale solution is very weak. We would like to have better pathwise weak solutions, for instance, but the problem is that we generally we don't have uniqueness. And this is an issue we have already have for in the deterministic case. When you have systems of these equations, uniqueness is hard. Usually, you don't have it, only in special cases. Uh, there's a number of things which are still open, so maybe you can help us <laughs> in some of the questions. <laughs> First of all, is that we plugged in here the stochastic term just you know, to, to deal with the new mathematical problem. But this is a more academic approach. I would like to derive it, since the left hand side you can justify it from basic physical principles. So I would like to derive also the noise terms from, from some, um, or, or at least to justify the noise terms. Um, well, so, for instance, what uh, could be done is usually. Uh, here, the um, stochastic first forcing on the right hand side is maybe not the most important term from the modeling viewpoint. It would be better to say that the fluxes are the important property which you would like to model, and then you have some uncertainty. So, it would be better to put maybe some uncertainty on the fluxes, and then this gives rise to such terms which have a kind of Dean Kawasaki structure, let's say, not exactly. But one need to derive these things, or maybe even to use more singular noise, at least to see how far you can go with these approaches. Over there's a big question, I think you asked that. <laughs> no, no, not you, somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we get regularization by noise? Since you would think, okay, you have a diffusion here, you have a kind of stochastic diffusion here. Um, should be better. Well, question mark. And what is also not clear is the existence of invariant measures or large time behavior, since we have this nice entropy structure. On the deterministic level, uh, this is enough to get some information about large time behavior. But in the stochastic setting, we had problems, especially because of the uniqueness issue. Our, our solutions have been too weak. There are some approaches, but up to now, we have not been able to exploit them. Yeah. 